you said it was close to Monterey or like yeah so it's central uh, coast it's um, just east of Salinas is where the ranch and it's between Hollister and Salinas and so it's on the northern tip of the Gabaland Mountains which is uh, a pretty long mountain range it goes down to Pinnacles and uh, and then right across the canyon it goes up into Mount Toro where the Dorrance Ranch is at and um, if you see um, there's a picture of of Tom Dorrance, Buck Branneman, and Ray Hunt sitting in a field horseback side by side. And um, that was taken up here on the ranch mm -hmm. and by Julie Baldocki. And so it's kind of an iconic picture that you'll see floating around. And um, they were good friends with the Dorrances here and they came up and helped brand. And, and Leslie Dorrance, I saw her about 10 years ago, um, I think at a roping or somewhere. And I, I was living in Eastern Oregon at the time and my kids were pretty little and it was pretty good winters for those little kids. And I said, if you know of anything and cause I was raised here in California and then I moved up to Eastern Oregon and I said, if you know anywhere in California, I'd be willing to come back there and get some better weather. And, um, she put my name in the hat for the Gavilan ranch. Um, and that's how I got here. Uh, All right. So that's a ranch that you're working at right now. Yep, been here for ten years. Yeah, managed the oh, wow. Gavilan Cattle Company. Yeah, and they're trying to do a lot to try to figure out this whole regenerative agricultural movement and where we can fit in it. And you know, we've got a lot of interesting challenges in California, and it's probably a lot like where you guys are at is um, a lot of small landscapes. So mm -hmm. our grasslands are essentially an endangered species, and so there's a lot of um, push to try to hold intact open landscapes for wildlife and for um and to keep the, a lot of our native plant communities going we have a mediterranean climate here which is only about two percent of the world's land mass and so it's a really interesting climate because it goes from essentially a rainforest and for about three months and so we'll get 20 to 50 inches of rainfall and then it goes to no rain and so we can have rain shut off in april and we won't see it until sometimes December. And that's not one drop. And so this is a really interesting um, environment and the plant communities and things are really biodiverse because they've kind of, um, they've kind of evolved to take that climate, which is kind of an interesting thing. So a lot of this landscape is converting and they're getting, you know, a lot of this open country converted to housing and other uses. And so essentially the biggest threat to a lot of these landscapes is conversion and so we're trying to figure out how to kind of position this cow herd in a way that we can reduce the fire fuel loads and add ecosystem services and and maintain a lot of these landscapes even if they do get gathered up by you know ranchettes or um whatever ends up grabbing a hold of these landscapes around us we can still come through and potentially manage the vegetation with our cow herd and then have access to kind of migrate off the mountain do a little work and come back to the ranch and there's a lot of opportunity for that and there's a lot of kind of a need for that here people brought in goats and goats are really popular but goats have a tendency to girdle the native trees and so they can kill a lot of your native trees and brush where cattle will trample it a little bit but it actually comes back pretty good so it can take a, a pretty good hit from a cow herd and so essentially that's what this ranch has been um, kind of experimenting with ways that we can add value with a cow herd instead of just trying to do it all on beef dollars. If we can figure out ways to position to uh, essentially capture funding to reduce fire fuel loads and things. That's one of the biggest risks in California is the mm. catastrophic wildfires that they have. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's been a really interesting place to work and the people who own this place want to figure it out. And so it's been a lot of electric fencing mixed with herding and placing cattle into tough places and then getting the right kind of cattle that you could also sell um, essentially, you know, to a, a regular commercial market. And so I don't have to run longhorns or wagus or, or I mean, um, um, some exotic breed that's going to not sell potentially across the scale. So wagus would probably do pretty good, actually. Yeah. So, so, so it sounds like you're really... mostly coming at this from an environmental standpoint. Um, where yeah, are you guys that's at in where terms of the regenerative ranching? Are you starting from scratch or have you been implementing this stuff for quite a while? Yeah. So before I got um, the job, the family who owns this ranch, the Reeves, Valdocchi and um, Boyle families, they um, 
told me about Alan Savory's work. You guys have probably been familiar with his work, but um, mm -hmm. essentially he's an ecologist. Uh, Alan Savory was an ecologist or is an ecologist in Africa. And uh, there's a TED Talk on there if you looked him up on the Internet. And uh, he gives a TED Talk and pretty much talks about how uh, he was in charge of a lot of these big parks down there. And they kept making an argument that the elephants were overgrazing it and they were doing a lot of damage. And so he did a bunch of scientific research and had it peer reviewed and every, all of his peers agreed that there's just too many elephants. And so they went around and shot 40,000 elephants. And the problem with the landscape got worse, not better. And so he's kind of been spending the rest of his life trying to figure out how to um, kind of rectify that decision. And what he did was uh, start bringing in cattle and bunching them tightly and moving them and, you know, understanding that the hooves and, and the mouths do a lot to add value to a landscape. And so essentially he came to the conclusion that we need more animals, not less grazing animals. And we need to manage them, you know, more uh, prescriptively. And so essentially it's, you know, you come in and you graze like the buffalo really intensively and then you leave and allow those plants to fully recover before you return. And so there's kind of a big holistic um, grazing movement that has been formulated around Alan Savory's work. And we've been trying to kind of figure out how to make that work in a, in a Mediterranean climate, which has been pretty fun. Hmm. Yeah. Like I, I heard a chicken in the background there. Are you guys implementing other animals besides beef cattle? Yeah, I got ducks. Cattle? I got a dove. I got a. Yeah, we've got bug beef cattle. <laughs> hey Jeff, have you ever read the book uh, "Man, Cattle, and Felt"? Yeah, with Johann Zeitzman. He's kind of the yeah. one that I've been looking at to try to understand how to really get high intensity grazing to work here. Um, yeah. We're always because it's so steep here, and we're on granitic soils that. It requires an incredible amount of animal impact to wake a lot of the plants in the soil profile that kind of need to be stimulated, but our water's spread out. And so getting that mm -hmm. kind of impact and picking a herd up and going to get a big drink has been kind of an interesting journey for the last 10 years to figure out how we can, you know, get a lot of impact and then also, you know, create infrastructure along the way to support that type because the water's always been the weak link here. And you know, getting those cattle to stay on a hillside and manage different topographies. We have to walk on contour because I've learned a lot about electric fencing, you know, and how to lay it out on contour instead of, and especially in really steep country, because those cattle make pretty big erosion points going up and down those fence lines to go to water. And so you got to kind of be, I've learned a lot about how to kind of lay things out for the year. And we lay our whole year out on the plan, our grazing plan. And then it, essentially we just, try to stick to it the best we can and then um, adjust for the next year. And so that we know exactly where we're going to be and when we're going to be there and then try not to go into that same field the same time of year. And so if I go in in April into a field, I'm going to try to go into it on a non growing season. So it'd be like a fall graze or a, a late summer graze the next time. And that'll be potentially my stockpile. And so I just kind of try to keep the landscape really confused because that's when you get the best expression of plant communities and so for the longest time a lot of these ranches have been stalker ranches in california because the grass comes on right about now and then mm. it shuts off because we're annual grass dominated we were kind of overrun by invasive uh, exotic grasses and so they came from europe and asia and they really took over during the mission days and rancho days because they had a lot of this country pretty grazed out they had just cattle all over the place during the hide and tallow years and the horses, too. They just, you know, had grazed a lot of this country out. And so it gave a perfect spot for a lot of our introduced annual grasses to kind of take a foothold. And they kind of run over the top of our native perennial grasses. And so essentially our goal is to what figure out what we can do to use our grazers to get more native perennial plants on the landscape. And what kind of pressure and pulse activity with that herd do we need to do? to try to create an environment where they can compete with the fast growing non-native annual grasses. And so, hmm. yeah, that, that's really good. So I just, I've been reading it for about the last year on and off and I just finished man cattle and felt. It's um, really difficult to kind of understand because it's, you know, he's, um, he's got a really practical way of explaining it, but yeah, I, I really mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I can't talk to it about my commercial cattle friends because, you know, they're pretty wrapped up on EPDs and you kind of got to be for the game. And 
and yeah. you know you got to be able to sell those cattle and understand what you got in front of you but he has a really interesting way of looking at a cow herd versus you know kind of the norm yeah. for sure yeah it um so originally when i went to school my degree is actually in industrial engineering mm. um from virginia tech and his approach to ranching and grazing it's very much in line with any sort of like systems engineering approach. Um, so a lot of it really resonated with me um, yeah. be, because he breaks it down per yep. acre and things like that. Um, and it was just, you know, everything you were describing uh, when you were talking about Alan Savory, the thing I think he says, uh, Zeitzman says in man, cattle and fell over and over again is South Africa is um, understocked. Um, and overgrazed. Yeah. 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 And man, that's, I, I feel like I can drive around this area. We're, um, we're in like the Southern, Southern Appalachians, just West, of, uh, just West of the Blue Ridge. And mm. I can see a lot of that here, but I mean, you can see a lot of that in a lot of places. Cause like you said, there's, um, that there's a game that a lot of people have to play to stay profitable especially on the commercial side so um. yeah i mean it's it's just the you know i shouldn't say the game but it's just the system that's in place the structures that are in place you have to right. kind of stay in those in those lines if you go too mm -hmm. far outside of those lines you're not going to be able to sell your cattle or you're not going to have the right kind of cattle to fit the program and so exactly. knowing that my goal was to figure out how we can tweak the cow herd we have now which is commercial angus and they've got, you know, some Hereford in there back there and there's some crossbred stuff in there. And so it's it's been a really good cow herd to kind of just close the genetics, keep back our own bulls and allow them to adjust to fit to this landscape. Because what's difficult about here is the water points are steep and there's a lot of country they got to work. So they're always on a hillside. And so if we buy bulls from the lowlands, no matter where they come from, they come here and they just can't handle hold up for breeding season. And so we would see a lot of bulls sitting by water and then the cows would, you know, they just wait to come get a drink and that's pretty much where they did their work. And then we started just keeping back our bulls because we had enough, enough of uh, genetic diversity that we felt good about doing that. And so we just started keeping back home raised bulls and they just started working the country. They knew the country, they were raised there. They just understood kind of how to maintain, manage themselves well here. And that really helped us in terms of their ability to go get cows around cows. And so that helped a bunch. And so just getting that phenotype adjusted to fit this landscape has been really interesting to watch, which, you know, in Johann Zeiman's book, it kind of talks about how to do that and streamline your herd. And then eventually we'll bring in some different genetics to kind of tweak it, to keep it really, you know, the right kind of cattle. And they haven't changed much other than they've come down a little bit on frame size. But essentially it's been a, the same looking cow that's been here when I came here, but it's been a... a an animal that's been able to utilize kind of what we have here because we have, we can set up some pretty tight, you know, we might have 800 head going into a two acre paddock or 20 acre paddock, depending on the growing season. And so we do 800 head on a five acre pasture or 10 acre pasture, and we move them every 24 hours or, or twice a day, depending on where we're at. So depending on how intensive we want to get with it, it takes a pretty special critter to kind of put up with that. And so we're really well suited for, being a cow ranch here because if you do that to yearlings and try to get gains you're going to probably run them a little more run that off of them or they're just not going to gain well moving that way on this kind of tough country so we're set yeah. up to be a cow ranch where they just they can raise a cow and you can use those cattle really well to help and enhance the ecosystem function and then when those calves hit the ground we're trying to work with local regenerative producers to get them off this property so that they can continue to grow and go down to easier country this is the middle of a Mexican land grant and on each side was the lower better, you know, um, ir for irrigation sake country was on each side of that Gavilan range. And so we don't have that ability to go down, but we're working with Picinus ranch who has the bottom, um, country. And so we just send those cattle down to them now and, and they can grow out those young cattle and then we'll get some heifers back that have been developed on, on some irrigated, uh, perennial pastures. And then we can bring them back up and, and, uh, that seems to be kind of a fun way to go right now. So, yeah it's been interesting yeah that's fascinating um so my next question because obviously we kind of know you through the ranch ropings and you know we can tell even by the painting behind you you ha have a great respect for the 
cowboy culture and, and, and all the things that um, kind of align with that. One thing I've always been <clears throat> curious about, and it seems like you're the right guy to ask about it. You know, with this regenerative ranching stuff, there's, it seems like there's getting more and more evidence to support it and, you know, using poly wire and high density grazing and things like that. Um, do you feel like there is still a role for a horse and all that? Or cause at least in the Eastern United States, not that horses were very involved at all, but we can graze so dense because of our rainfall that, I mean, some of the ones I've visited in the Eastern United States, the cows are very, very docile and can, you just point them any direction. They just yeah. kind of mosey wherever you want. And yeah. if you didn't want to ever fool with a horse, you'd never have to. Yeah. So where, you know, in this new system you're describing, is there still a role for the horse? And can you describe that if there is one? Yeah. So, and that's something that I kind of took on coming here because I have uh, done a lot of electric fence work now. And then the goal was because I love horseback culture and I want to see it thrive. How do we do this horseback? Well, knowing that, you know, the arid West is never going to be something you can really do a lot of electric fencing in a lot of country because it's just too dry. It takes too many acres per cow, you know, get her fed. So my goal is to showcase what we can do with night pens. And so if we can build out that electric night pen, and all we have to do is drift to that night pen. And then during the day, those cattle go back out and you got people going with those, those, that herd and taking that herd somewhere, whether it be a strategic place. Like for you, if you took that herd out of your front driveway and say, I'm going to graze these bar ditches and I'm going to go all the way down to say the back of the store in town where there's an open lot and that's your night pen. And so then you've just created the ability to, be horseback, move your cattle around into a place, put them up for the night. The next day it's moving the herd to somewhere else so that you're adding value in your community horseback because you can't do that on foot with quads. I mean, essentially you, it would take the same kind of manpower as it would people horseback. And so you might as well just be horseback and you can make those horses because you're already starting colts and riding horses. So you can go and set things up to go do that stuff with horses. And I think you can make a, a pretty neat, uh, time out of it because not only that is now you can incorporate all your clients to come participate in that act and so they come they get on those colts for you you've started them we're going out today to move the herd and that is just another value add to taking the herd that you're already adding value you know whether you're getting grant money for fire fuel reduction or you're saving somebody to have to run their mower in your country and you're just mobbing those cattle through their horseback you've just created kind of some stacked enterprises along the way and then people are horseback again. And then you're doing a job with your horse. It's not, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's just taking a herd of cattle from point A to point B. And those cattle are gentle. So they're going to be kind of have a good experience with the people that you have around you. And you can use anybody from all your neighbors. And then you set it up where it's, you know, it's just, you're back out there horseback again. And it's TP living and it's the whole thing. You can add the whole package to where everybody would love to participate in that. And then you've just created that nomadic pastoralism that we're missing in our landscapes and you've done it in a way that's in the urban setting essentially where you're just moving through this these corridors and then you know as you start to create wildlife connectivity essentially that's the problem is once you start breaking up these big pieces of land and you break them into even ranchettes it stops the way wildlife move well eventually you guys can start figuring out ways because they your biologists do all the mapping and they show you where your terrestrial um, wildlife can't move and so you'll find all the choke points and you go well what if we built a wildlife corridor from here to a to b but i'm gonna have to maintain that with domestic grazers because it's gonna grow full of brush and then you know of course your predators are gonna love to ambush everything right there so you got to keep maintaining these big migration corridors for your wildlife you've just created wildlife connectivity and then you've just become an asset to your community with a herd of cows horseback again. And so my long-term vision is to do that here. And I would love to see that kind of expand because labor is always the big issue on these ranches. If you talk to anybody from Nevada, all the cow bosses, they'll tell you that they just can't get the help there. You know, they just can't get the people who want to be out doing that. But you guys are in a really good place where people would love to participate in that way of life. 
and bring their horses out and do things like that that I think would be incredible. And then if you're night penning and you can set things up to go, say, I'm going to go send my rosin jaw crew up on the span and we're going to set up a big night pen and we're going to put, you know, a thousand head of cattle in there for the night. You just drift them to that night pen and then you have your buck crew crew go do whatever they're going to do. And then you pick them up and do the same thing wherever you want impact. You're going to fall somewhere because the problem is with desert places, you can't get enough fertility on the ground without bunching those cattle. Well, there's nothing for those cattle to eat, but you mm-hmm. can slow drift those cattle all day, fill them up and then park them somewhere at night to get do their pooping and their peeing. You've just condensed all of that fertility into one spot, and then you get to slow drift and fill those cattle up again. But you never lose control of them. You're always kind of moving them where, you know, most big desert places in the West, you kick them out, and then you got to spend all this time getting them back together again. And so if you set that system up a little different where you could just stay with them and keep them, you know, a little more, um, a little more dense then you could probably manage kind of the horse and the horses i th- I just don't see them ever leaving that way if we, if we set it up that way and just decide that's how we want to do it and then incorporate that the difficult thing that i see is a lot of people are getting that there's too big of a divide between people who live in town and want to do horse stuff but if you see a herd of cows walk right by your house and you see people horseback you go what are they doing and then all of a sudden you got that kid that comes outside and goes i've never seen this and all of a sudden you just got more people back into horses again and back into that way of life. Cause I was raised in town and I didn't even know cowboys were a thing until I was grounded in my room one day and got a national geographic. And there was sure enough, Kurt Marcus had gone to Nevada and I'm like, what are these guys? This guy's got a pistol on his hip and covered in alkali dust. And so that was it for me. And then I said, I want to go do that. And so I just don't think a lot of people understand that we still are here and still are really relevant, you know? So, I just think it would be a really neat way to do that. And you can use the, uh, the electric fence, but I just decide that I want to keep horseback culture. So how do we can limit that and then add value with the horseback culture? Sure. Sure. So I, I that all is very interesting to me. I, I want to kind of repeat it back to you because I do want to understand what you're saying completely. Yeah. So, so you're saying like a classic example of regenerative ranching is at least here when I think about it is you've got like an automatic water or something, some sort of water source, right? And then a perimeter fence. And then a lot of times they'll just like pinwheel around the water source, right? So what you're saying is rather than the pinwheel and like the gradual movement, have kind of basically move the herd more. Is that what you're saying? And like, so, you know, say you have, I don't know, like a, for easy, like a thousand acre spread, right? And you're talking about, you know, going to one edge over here and night penning and then going to another spot here. And then, you know, that does, if you have the landscape to do it, right. and the, the right social situation to do it, yeah. you can create, you know, someone's got like five acres on their ranchette that they're not going to, Hey, they're not going to do anything with it. Yeah. Well, then you can go, if you can get that herd there, yeah. you're saying like night pen there. Yeah. Um, even as, as long as there's still like a mechanism to get the cattle from point A to point B, you open up the possibility of getting all these little patches that yeah. might not otherwise get grazed. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's essentially what I see working well in places that have been kind of broke up, but, and then also allow for the, horseback culture to kind of work where you know if you're just on you know 80 acres and you got it cut up in the pastures and you know it can be set up in a way where you can't really do a lot horseback other than just moving point a point b but creative ways to do that you know a lot of people put their water points in one spot and that always becomes the spot that's kind of been pounded on you know and so if you can move that water to create impact you're going to see different plants express and you know you don't want that compaction down there by the water points and pretty soon you just have the moonscape that nothing's going to grow granted it's a small percentage of your landscape but uh over time that starts to permeate out away from that water trough and you see less and less vegetation where most cows when they go to water they're going to get a drink you're going to count to 60 seconds she's going to get a full drink then she's going to turn around and either graze right there close or she's going to lay down and so she's not going to get up and go very far and wherever she's going to, to go find tall grass, you'll always find that every corner of your pasture and the farthest corners are going to be your best feed because they just pound everything up to the water point. And if you can mm-hmm. put water in that back corner and move water over here and 
pretty soon you just change the entire impact of that landscape where it, it responds differently. And so, you know, you just got to do with what you can, but it seems like if you can be pretty mobile with water and mobile with fences, you can just create all sorts of different impacts that are going to create different expressions the next year when your plants come and grow. And uh, you're just going to see different pioneer plants come in by your old water points where they're going to try to break up compaction. Your taprooted weeds are going to come in and all the things that need to happen to break that soil back up and put it back into a grassland again. It's just natural stage of succession. But yeah. yeah, there's just interesting creative ways to try to figure out how to incorporate regenerative agriculture, which really hasn't been defined. And so it's, you know, essentially for me, it's just I'll let someone else define it, but I'm just essentially going to try to grab a hold of the things that are concerning the people in my area. And so I'm trying to listen to not so much, you know, where the cattle market is going on the trend line. I'm trying to look at how can I add value to my community with these cattle. And so what does that look like? And so that talk, that means I need to sit down with wildlife biologists. I need to sit, talk to Caltrans about how we can move cattle back and forth to different places. And if we have, you know, wildlife connectivity issues or, you know, invasive plants coming in, what can we do to help there and add value? And so essentially that end product is going to be beef, but it should be a byproduct of essentially what we're doing to enhance our ecosystems around us. And so if we can be potentially capitalized on that and be paid for, you know, they're paying fire crews right now to do prescribed fire in California all over the place. And I, I'm not sure what the number is that Gavin Newsom just cut a check to Cal Fire for, but it's an incredible amount of money. And if we can just create, you know, packages that they can sign a check to and say, here, take your cows over here and reduce the fire fuel loads, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going to pay firefighters to go in there and do that. They can pay cows to go in there and do that and reduce the, you know, the manpower. And so yeah, I don't and see probably why. have a better economic impact, ecological impact, I mean. The yeah. firefighters that are just going in and taking care of the problem, the cows will well, leave something and it's, too. And that's the trouble is it's not, you know, they're positioned as firefighters. They're not positioned as ecologists. And so mm -hmm. firefighters are designed and trained to put out fire. And so when they put fire on the ground prescriptively, it's not done in a way that's um, they're worried about, you know, sensitive plants or sensitive species. They're just putting fire on the ground. And so you can walk in there with a ecologist and a herd of cows and you can be really careful and nimble about what you're doing to lay that plant material down. And then you're not just burning the whole forest down with, with fire. You know, you're essentially walking cattle around and saving a lot of native plant species and doing a lot of things that um, essentially you would lose in a fire or you'd have to cut down to reduce the fire fuel loads and make slash piles so that you don't get a crack catastrophic fire. So there's some interesting things that we can do with the cow herd now that's you know, kind of interesting in the West, you go, you know, you guys in the East probably don't have as big of a fire issue, but you definitely have to reduce that vegetation. And so there's oh, yeah. probably a big demand. We've for got that. more fires than you think. They've definitely uh, gotten a lot worse in my lifetime. Interesting. We had a pretty significant fire here in the Shenandoah Valley, which is, I don't know, 150 miles from us, but I mean, it, it made the sky black here. So yeah, yeah we, we've got more problems than most people think which is interesting <laughs> it's probably because of the same thing you know we're having we've got less farms less ranches yeah. stuff's getting grazed a lot less yeah and i mean it seems like we're positioned well to participate in in the value add there where you know a lot of people in the cattle business are pretty scarcity driven and so we're always you know chasing grass or begging for a place to go and you know are out you know real competitive with our friends to go out bid somebody on a lease you know and we're trying to pay as much as we can for grass when in fact we're adding something with these cows and you know it wouldn't it would be like somebody coming up to a landscape crew and asking me to mow my grass for and then hand me a check to do it you know and i'm going that's mm -hmm. different <laughs> but that's how the cattle industry always is because we're always chasing that you know to get pounds of beef but if we realize that the real power of this cow herd is to add more life to that landscape and and add mm -hmm. value i think it'll put us in a little different position so yeah yeah, the listening to you talk about moving the water sources, the thing that really clicked for me to understand this stuff was in Man Cattle and Felt when he says uh, there's a difference between one cow walking a path 365 days a year yeah. versus 365 cows walking a path for one day yeah and 
the three three hundred sixty five cows that hey, walk out for one day, they will. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, you look like you're on the you. move. You look like a man on a mission. Yeah. I am. I'm back in my pickup. Hey, my my internet's totally janked, man. I don't have any internet. Period here. Um, okay. So if you're good, I would just carry on. Okay. Okay. I understand. Okay. Okay. No, that that's not a problem, man. Sorry it uh solid sorry it fell short. Yeah. We'll get it sorted out. You'll get Starlink soon and you'll be sorted. Take care. Talking Technology. about a guy who's had a rough day. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but um well sorry about that. I it you're okay. I I do want to keep talking about this stuff though. Sure, sorry. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um oh the the one one cow walking the same path for a year versus a bunch of cattle walking the same path for a day. It, it's the difference, even though intuitively someone might think it's the same thing, it's the difference between stimulating the soil and hardening it to the point where it's just not productive. Um, yeah. And that, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of nuance within that. But I think that example for me was really kind of a a bigger uh, a bigger way to demonstrate that there can be such a positive impact if this is done the right way and you yeah. um and you know it it varies on what kind of density you're dealing with but yeah the these big ruminants they have a lot of impact even the small ones the, that's that's gotten to be a popular thing around here um especially you know I guess cuz we're in the mountains and there is a lot of brush and quite frankly, all the grassland around here is man-made. You know, mm. this was, um, you know, you read books and they said when people landed at Jamestown, a squirrel could go from Jamestown to the Mississippi and not touch the ground because it was all woods here. So all of our grasslands are man-made now yeah. pretty much. And, uh, it, it's, uh, goat, goats have kind of taken off because if you leave anything, it just becomes dense forest again. Yeah. 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 But that that's really cool. I um you know, like I said, when we reached out to you, I I knew you from uh being the commentator at the Pro Am and um and some other ranch ropings and stuff. So I did not know uh this side of you at all, but that's really interesting. We've had a couple other um guys that have been into this stuff on the podcast and the more I listen to it is it just seems like more and more rhetoric all the time for um, how there can be some big positive changes. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're experimenting with it. I wouldn't tell anybody to change what they're doing, but it's just, sure. you know, we're trying, we're on that journey to try to figure it out. And we're positioned in a place where, you know, in California, climate smart solutions, you hear all these different terms coming down the pipeline. And so if I can create, uh, a, a product which is a cow herd that adds value um, and addresses a lot of these resource concerns, then that's the position we need to be in to continue to ranch into the future. And so, you know, if we can stop, you know, becoming or looked at as an extractive uh, process and add value, then people are going to change the way they look at, you know, um, you know, cattle as a whole here in California, you see things like meatless Mondays and there's big vegan movements around. And mm -hmm. the difficult part about that is there's just a big disconnect between how the food is made and who's eating the food. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, a, a cow herd managed well can do an incredible amount to enhance the ecosystem function. And if you remove grazers from these California landscapes, these grasslands, you lose your sensitive species because it's, that herd pressure that pushes back all of those invasive plants. And when you remove that and say, you need to get cattle out of here, all of a sudden you lose your red-legged frogs, your tiger salamanders, your spec checker spot butterflies, because they evolved with these native wildflowers and native perennial grasses. And so you have a thatched landscape full of, you know, um, of grass. A salamander can't move through that, um, that old grass anymore. And so, because they evolved under a, a pretty intensive grazing regime, which were elk here and tule elk, 
And, you know, 500,000 was what they had counted on them when they, after they got done killing most of them. And so they had a huge herd of antelopes and tule elk that moved up and down this coast in east and west. And they did a lot to keep a lot of that stuff down, but they also didn't have the invasive grass factor. And so they were just maintenance tools. Now they can participate in that as a maintenance tool again, because we're getting our tule elk herds back, but you still need domestic livestock to push back those invasive plants or else your native tule elk can't, won't have anything to eat because you'll lose a lot of your native um, grasses. And so essentially, you know, it's, it's trying to find that balance where you can utilize cattle to enhance this ecosystem to allow your native flora and fauna to flourish. And so we we're doing a lot of work. We work with point blue conservation science and they do a lot of, um, uh, data points on the ranch. And so they do soil carbon shallow and at depth, they do, um, plant species, plant spacing, um, species richness. And so we have different points that are showcasing over time. We're going to have a long-term data set that showcases that what we're doing is adding value. And so just from the time we've had point blue come in, which I think was 2016, they have two data sets on the, it's every, uh, soil, I think it's every five years, and then plants are every other year, or every two years. And so just in that time of them being here, we've tripled the amount of native perennial grasses on this landscape by managing this way. And so we're tying, we're trying to make that connection, that change in management and adding, you know, to the um, native flora and fauna. If we can make that connection solid, we've just put ourselves in a really good position to add value. And so essentially that's going to put us out, you know, in 50, 60 years into the future with a cow herd. And so, and that just opens up California to us because now we have a cow herd that's broke to not only cows and dogs and horses and our electric fences, we can take these cattle nimbly anywhere. We can weave them down right through Silicon Valley and we can put them over on uh, essentially anywhere we want to go with them. And that's something that we're trying to position for that um, I don't think a lot of ranchers think about, you know, where they, mm. a lot of them, pretty overworked and you know they they can't really do that and so we're trying to put spend a lot of time getting this cow herd really um ameliable or um, uh, pliable to going and putting them in different settings and that's opened up a market for us because we have people um santa lucia preserve claudio manages that and that's has some really high-end homes built into it and he needs cattle that can be put into electric fence to um, graze around this open space around these large homes. It's 20,000 acre Mexican land grant that has really high end homes on it. Well, you don't want, you know, cattle going up and getting in the middle of somebody's swimming pool or, you know, scratching, right. you know, all those things. And so if you can do that, now I have a herd ready to go that anybody can call me and say, we need something prescriptive over here. And then we can put them on trucks and go add value somewhere else. And then, you know, potentially mm -hmm. capture funding for that. And, you know, and so it's, a position that a lot of ranchers haven't really thought about that I think would be a really neat place for people to look. And then it gives me something to do with my horses, it gives me places to go and get into the, because you got to build three things. You got to add, you know, to your natural capital, you have to add value to your landscape. You have to be economically viable and then you have to build social capital and building social capital takes me off the ranch and it takes me somewhere to the public and adds people into the, you know, conversation. And so teaching people about, you know, what we do has really kind of been an interesting journey for me because it takes me really understanding it to try to explain it to people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not only are you an ambassador, but you're a spot, um, you're in a spot where you can build your brand both personally and for your ranch. Yeah. To, and you know, e even if you're not, trying to be famous one day like famous jeff who could take his cows anywhere right that brand will create more opportunities for you yeah by building that in in the correct way um the two things that come to mind when you talk about being able to do that which sounds really cool to cool to me i think that would like if, if a guy could make a living doing something like that that would that'd be a lot of fun yeah. Um, I do think that puts a lot of pressure on both your stockmanship and the people that work for you. Yeah. So, um, can you talk a little bit about maybe how, how you go about putting a handle on cattle to, to do that and 
to have them be that pliable? And then what are you doing with the folks that work for you? Like the actual guys that are handling these cattle every day. Um, yeah. do you have some sort of, you know, it's probably not formal education, but some sort of education you want to make sure they have. So you can trust that they're, you know, all the cattle or all the hooves are in the right places at the right time. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's really kind of been the fun part is, you know, I've really tapped into Bud Williams um, work. And I don't know if you know who he is, but he's kind yes, of a yeah. pretty good stockman and um, left a legacy of, of good stockmanship. And so really trying to work with understanding that um, cows are smart and we're never we're never trying to, you know, essentially they're not something we don't like. We they're really smart. And what we find is if we can just hold those cattle up and get all of our lead cattle turned and settled, all of our, like when I first came to this ranch, a lot of these cattle just disappear into the trees and you wouldn't see them. And so we spent a lot of time just pulling roe deers together. And so that meant pulling cattle, you catch them at water, especially in the summertime, you'll catch them at water around 10, they'll all go to water. So you build your roe deer out at water and then you park them there and then you pick them up from water and take them somewhere and place them somewhere. And so you'll go take these cattle off and go put them into some tall feed and then you settle them in the way that all the energy is out of that herd so that they, they don't have a creep in them, meaning they're not just slow walking out of that bunch where you just put them back together in a way that you're not bouncing them off of you. They're just stopping at you, so to speak. So they drift into you and they just stop and they don't hit you and turn around like you're a wall. So your, your energy is mm -hmm. not shooting cattle off of you where a lot of people have a tendency to ride in before their energies felt and so by the time they understand that their energies moving those cattle their horses energies just move those cattle and everything about them is too close so learning how to do everything from a far away distance in your chest where it's all in your chest and if you can feel it in your chest that you move to cattle with your chest and you don't laser focus on animals because we're a pre predator. And if you start staring at an animal like you're going to get it, it knows it and it leaves the country. And so everything about the way that you work cattle, and I learned it by watching like Billy Askew and, and guys that are really good in cattle, they always work out of their periphery. So they'll walk into a herd of cattle and they're never laser focused on one animal. They're always just kind of slow looking across the herd. And they'll catch the animal that they want in their periphery and they just kind of ease into a position. And sometimes he'll even back into a position. If you watch Martin Black, he's so good at just floating in the cattle without that energy leaving. And so learning people's energy and you're going to have people, clients and people that come out that are just high energy. And essentially they'll be on the far outside just holding roe deer. And some of their horses, once they get into a roe deer, they're going to fall apart and come apart. And the that's actually good for your cows though because every time things fall apart you guys get to just put them back together and that process alone creates a cow herd that will do the right thing regardless of what's going on and so now this cow herd no matter who we have working with us they will get into the wrong position and the cows know what to do to the point where they're waiting for that person to get out of their way so they can go about their business. And it's been a really interesting thing to watch here is because people can just be talking and hanging out and drinking a glass of wine and totally in the wrong spot. And those cattle will just wait and then they'll get out of the way. And then those cattle will just continue the flow because they've kind of hooked to that understanding that these cows always wait and ask for permission. So most places you go, when you start gathering cattle, they're going to say, we cannot, we only have to go, we have to go this way because that's the way they go all the time. On this ranch, we go somewhere different all the time. And so our cattle are never thinking, I have to go this way. This is the way out of this pasture. It's like, no, I'm going to go park you over here and I'm going to give you permission to go over there. And so you're never allowed to just go making decisions right now. You're going to wait for me to help guide you because I put myself as the lead cow and so when i ask them to go they're going to go and so it's been really fun to try to understand how to build myself into a lead cow position versus a pusher of cattle or a herder of cattle and that's sometimes you got to throw it all away and put your cows back together and then go back to a lead position but it's it's really fun to try to figure out how little it takes and then what i find is 
all the people that are with you don't have to be real handy because you can get those cows because they're waiting on you all the time. So even if you have something fall apart with someone who's really green, those cattle know to wait. They're like, okay, what is this person asking me to do? And so they're just kind of like a good saddle horse where they're just like, everything can be falling apart around them and they just stop and they just go, what is going on? And then pretty soon they, there's certain things they know to tell them to go forward, you know? And so you can do that with a cow herd too, which is what I'm finding. It's been really fun because then those cows just get really kind of just waiting on you and gentle. And then you can walk it like our cattle don't ever leave. So we ride through them and they'll just stay laying down until you ask them to get up. And so that's something that's really different in a lot of places where horseback crews will come out and those cows will just stand up and trot off somewhere. And you're like, this is going to be a long day. And so it's a different relationship with a cow herd and you guys probably in smaller country can get a good relationship with cows. Like you're saying, it's about now building that communication about respect. I'm asking you to go and now I need you to go. And that's probably a little different than it's just like a horse that's been oversensitized or over desensitized where mm-hmm. you start to have to build up a fire to get them to do anything. And then sometimes that can get kind of ugly because they're just like so desensitized that nothing's going to wake them up. And so they're, toes are dragging all the time and so pretty soon you got to build them where they'll respect you to kind of move away from that pressure and same thing with a cow herd you kind of got to build that into them too because you can over probably desensitize them you know yeah yeah Yeah, there you definitely see that around here a little bit especially if somebody's got like 20 cows in the back pasture right and their wife walks through them every day you yeah. know and puts them on instagram or whatever you bet um, you bet yeah, and then and then they actually go to do anything w- with those cattle and they ask you to come help and it's like oh my gosh they're taking out the congress <laughs> to get these things moved, you know um but you're talking about the saddle horse that sounds almost exactly like the advice you know, Buck talks about Ray giving him, and I know Buck's given that to a lot of people, is if you're going to ride horses for the public, get them gentle. And it sounds yeah. like what you're talking about is get those cattle gentle. Yeah. To get where them someone doesn't have to be perfectly dialed to get the job done at the yeah. end of the day. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you were talking about the glass of wine. I, I won't say who, because I, I like all my clients, but I did have a lady um, at one point tell me, I said, well, what do you want to be able to do with this horse? You know, And she said, I just want to be able to have a few glasses of wine with my girlfriends and then go take him on a trail ride and he'll be safe. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and like, you know, I'm sitting there like in, in the back of my mind, I just got my hands on my face and I'm like, what do I do for a living? But then and I'm like, okay, yeah, well, we'll get him real gentle for you. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know maybe one day she'll aspire to do something a little more with her horse. Cause I know he's capable of doing a little more, but yeah. that's, um, you know, that they need, there are people that need that out of their animals and it doesn't hurt the animals a darn bit to be able to deal with people like that. Yeah. You know? Well, and there's, you know, my idea of being a cowboy and horsemanship is different than a lot of people. And so there are people who love to just, have a horse that walks and they have a glass of wine and they mm-hmm. even get off and lead that horse and follow some cows and they're just having the time of their lives because they're out yeah. doing something different. And I think that's wonderful because they have horses with them and they're participating in this really special way. And I mean, if you look at Africa, they have some 13 year old kid with a stick in his hand that takes those cows out of the night pen into country full of lions. And that little kid just herds those cows around with a stick on foot. And so we get to do this thing. It's not rocket science. We get we make it harder than it has to be. And that little kid will put those cows back at night. And that's essentially there are people who would love to be able to do that with horses. And so we don't have to do uh, a bunch of stopping and sliding and, and, you know, big ranch rope and stuff. We can have people that are just tickled plumb to death to be there cooking over the camp stove and setting up teepees and just participating in the stories and you know it's a it's it takes that's what's neat about kind of thinking about this herding type of culture is there's a place for everyone in it and it's just figuring out how to stack that in and understand their personalities because me I'm wanting to try to get a little more out of something or I'm chasing maybe a little better turnaround on a horse or a little better feel and there's people that you'll have that are just tickled plumb to death that that horse is just kind of pulling into their hands all day and they just have the time of their lives and I envy them 
I really do. <laughs> just like, they're so happy. And I'm just like, I'm micromanaging my horse, you know, and they're just out there just living their full life. You know, it's pretty great. Yeah. And those horses that they'd be riding, I'd worry about, you know, and I'm usually worried about somebody getting hurt and they just take care of them. And I look, ah, they're amazing animals. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, it's kind of like the thing, you know, how there's you know, so-and-so will buy a cowboy hat because maybe they're going to the local rodeo and they're like, well, I got to have a cowboy hat for the local rodeo. And then there's people who maybe ride horses for a living or they're a cowboy or something like that. And they'll be like, oh, well, you know, that person, they just bought that hat at the tractor supply or yeah. whatever. Um, but you got to have the perspective of, you know, it's way better that that person wants to be a part of this. Absolutely. That person, you know, wants to shut your industry down or like doesn't want there to be cowboys anymore I know. or anything like that so it yeah it's kind of in line with people people wanting to be a part of that industry and that lifestyle is a good thing yeah um, and even if they're not bought in the way some people are it, it's a good thing to have interest in it kind of goes back to what i was saying like it's a it only helps to have kind of a bigger brand and more people interested in what you got going on. Yeah. And I mean, and it's, if you think about it, it being for the horse's sake, I mean, we don't need horses anymore. I mean, you can go get on a quad, do thing, everything you need to do. So what mm -hmm. are horses? Where are they going to fit? You know? And so we have to make horses, you know, they, they deserve a place in our lives to, be honored and participate and to have anybody out there just wanting to do that is really special to me, you know? And so if they can participate in any way, shape or form, it's, it's going to help a horse, you know? And so, which is kind of, you know, I think it's a, that's the reason that, you know, a lot of this regenerative ag stuff, a lot of people aren't cowboy culture. They're not really, they're kind of, you know, electric fences and quads and doing stuff. And that's great. But I really want to save horses and I'll save horse culture. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be just an lead a sport anymore, you know? And so that's, what's happening to horses is, you know, only the wealthy can afford them and the wealthy can do all the, the things that, you know, they can do with horses in these events. These, you know, you go down up and down the road so much, you, you can't afford it. Most people. And so if you can make horses just ownership again and having horses for pleasure riding and things like that, something to aspire to and, and, really celebrate i think it's a great place to you know kind of concentrate yeah yeah i'd agree well and talking about you know the horses that those people have it might be kind of a simple job but gosh that's probably better you know that horse probably enjoys that more oh my god toting around in the arena for 45 minutes you know three Absolutely. days a week or something like that yeah no i think yeah. they'd have a really good time and then they you know then they're participating in a pretty sacred act, which is hurting. And then, you know, the byproduct of that is going to be meat. And, you know, all of that is starting to get frowned upon in a lot of places. You don't see meat hanging in these stores and you don't see the local butchers on the corner anymore. And in our area, you have to travel a long way to get your cattle processed and find a butcher. And the butcher that's in Hollister, he's in a side alley that nobody really even knows about, you know. And the problem is we need to celebrate that. We need to have meat hanging again and so if you go into an asian market here or into a mexican market here that culture is completely different and there are animals hanging behind the meat racks and they're cutting meat up behind there and it's all the local community and that culture is just gathered and they're having a really great time because they re realize that that's a sacred act and you walk into a safeway or something close by around here you don't see that happening it's just people cutting up little bits and putting them under cellophane wrap and you don't see the big um the big parts of that and you know you don't see our teenagers getting into that and butchers are going by the wayside anymore and so it should be a really special craft and it should be celebrated and and honored and to be able to get these animals that have added so much life to our lives and helped with you know enhancing the ecosystem we should celebrate that and be honored to be able to participate in that act and that's something that I see a big disconnect in and I'd love to try to bridge that gap. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you that there's quite a disconnect, but you know, at least for me, so I'm, I'm 28 and I, I grew up in what I would consider a rural area, but we have a big university 
nearby. So there's a lot of people who are here because of the university. And for whatever reason, they they didn't grow up in the same lifestyle I yeah. did. And, you know, I don't hold that against them. But what's cool is you talk to people or like, I, I even if I just go to town and my uh, pants are kind of muddy and I've got my cowboy hat on, like there's almost like a yearning. People want to talk to you yeah. more often than not. People want to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, they want to know, you know, why, uh, why you like have a stock trailer at the local supermarket or something like that. Um, and I even saw the other day, you know how I, when I was a kid, like history channel used to be real history. And now it's a bunch of kind of nutty stuff and like game shows and stuff like that. But they've got, um, they've got this TV show now that is like, I don't know what it is, but it's like America's next top butcher basically. Oh wow. And like yeah. every, every time, every episode they bring in like four butchers and they take them through phases and they got to like do different butcher challenges. And sometimes they got to use like historical axes and historical um, cleavers and knives and things like that to do these things. And then at the end, someone is like the top butcher of that episode and they've nice. got like win some prize money and stuff. But the fact that that's even a TV show, yeah, I do think there's a yearning for that reconnection. I think you're um, right because because there is that gap, and I think people can only exist for so long with that gap there yeah. um, before they come in and say, "Okay, there." Like, you know, I drive down the interstate, and there's all this land and all this agriculture. And then there's me in my life and somewhere between there, there's this part I'm missing. And, um, I, I do think there's a yearning for it. It just takes one, those people to maybe get out of their comfort zone. And for a lot of times people in agriculture to get out of their comfort zone, to want to be around those people and talk to those people. Yeah. Because, you know, everyone knows like, the cranky 70 year old rancher yeah. that, you know, he's like, I'd be fine if I never went down again, you know, I don't yep. want to talk to those people. <laughs> and I was like, well, that, that's a really good way to, you know, make friends and influence people. Right. It's just like the hell with them. I'm staying on this same little patch outside of town for the rest yeah. of my life. Um, yeah. That seems to be kind of the natural progression of ranching is everybody gets further and further away from town. It doesn't go to town and they kind of get tight lipped about it. And then you, you see your beef producers get into a program where they, want you know the public to know their producers well then they stand them in a grocery store with their you know and they're like meet your producer and they're they, they're just like they have no idea how to talk to anybody and it's like i don't know if that was really helping but they met the producers and they're great people but there's kind of a story that needs to be told and a, a skill set mm -hmm. that needs to be developed when interacting with the public that you can bring those people into the fold you know and so it's kind of interesting that there definitely is you know the and that's the difficult part is i'm fighting is you hear cowboys say we're the last of a dying breed, and I do not want that to happen. There's no reason for that to happen. And if you believe that, you end up entrenching yourself in wherever you're at instead of saying, how do we – it's up to us to bridge these gaps. It's up to us. We, we are the citizens of this country. We have to figure out the kind of future we want it to look like. And so – I want horses. I want horseback culture. I want pastoralism back out there. I want cattle and sheep and goats walking down through your towns. I want them maintaining your roadways. I want to see meat hanging in the stores. I want to see people horseback. I want to see your kids getting out of school into riding academies or riding programs. I want them to have to go be on the wagon and participate as a society in this food growing thing. I want that kind of United States. I don't want Hey, I live in town. I don't know where my food comes from. Oh, also we're importing it all from different countries and COVID hits and now there's no food on the shelves. And what do we do? I just stabbed somebody over a roll of toilet paper. I don't know. You know, <laughs> things are pretty fragile. So I think, yeah. well, I don't, I don't want it to be that way. And I don't know why it has to be that way, but I think we just have to decide we want to see that change in the world and just figure out how to make it happen. Because if we leave it to the people who are system thinkers, who are running the boards, who are sitting on these big decision-making platforms, they're not people with boots on the ground who see this. They're just going with the information that's given them to them in their silos. And they live mm -hmm. so disconnected from people out into the world that work these big landscapes. And so 
trying to figure out how to, you know, communicate that up to the places where decisions are made are really difficult, you know. And so, for instance, there's the 3030, the AB 3030, which was um, legislation that was passed here in California that puts 30 percent of all land and water into conservation or protections. And so that was drafted by uh, Ash Kalra, who's in San Jose, and he's a vegan. And so knowing that, I have to figure out how to get language into that bill saying, yeah, you can protect and conserve these big 30% of open space, but we have to be a management tool to maintain those. And you can't, you don't, you don't want to kick grazing off of that. And you may hate grazing animals and domestic grazers and whatever your beliefs are, but we need these animals on these landscapes to keep them vibrant. And so having a body of scientific work that I can go and set on the desk and say, here's the data that showcases that we can add value. And so we need to have a place within this 30% conservation land so that we can participate in management of that land. And so just things like that, that kind of makes you, you know, go, okay, who, I, I love the idea, but also what, who's making these decisions. And so that person may not have a firm understanding of what's going on out here on these grasslands because he lives in the city of San Jose and Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. And so that may have a big disconnect. And so I just need to make sure that he has all the information so that when we make these decisions, there's, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. Cause if you remove all that and you have 30% of California ungrazed in grasslands, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose yeah. incredible wildlife and incredible native plant communities. And it can happen so fast and so knowing that it's just we just have to decide that we want the world to look differently and, and decide how we want it to go and so you know i have no place I'm, and i've never been able to stay in my lane but who who's gonna do it you know and who i i don't know how to do any of this stuff so but somebody has to decide that we don't want to just be shoved off into the corner and forgotten and you know looked at like we don't, we're not needed when in fact this whole process needs to be kind of laced back together where everybody sees a cow herd walking down through their town, they get filled with pride and not, you know, a, a sense of disdain or offensive um, to see that, you know? Yeah. 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 I, one of the coolest things, it, it's always a double edged sword for me because if I could snap my fingers tomorrow and never have to get back on social media, I think I'd probably be a happier person. Um, that being said, I run, a podcast and I run a business where social media um, it instigates a lot of my business. Yeah. So one of the coolest things I've seen on Instagram lately that people have been sharing, it's this saying that it's not that you were born too late. It's that you were born just in time to keep the traditions alive. Yeah. yeah that's you know, good that's way. like a really good way to yeah. like, th that's what comes to mind when, um, when I hear you talk about this stuff, but Man, it is, it is a struggle because I don't know. I guess it all comes back to relying on people to not be too tribal and not so close-minded, right? Because one, we don't need that old rancher who never wants to go to town. We don't need him. And then at the same token, we don't need the politician who is elected in a major city to decide, well, I know enough to start dictating how we're going to manage these big landscapes that I really have no experience out on, but we're going to manage them the way I feel like we need them managed because it would make me feel better morally, legally, professionally, if we did it that way, yeah. you know? And so well, and we have to be careful too, because a lot of the information that those policymakers are getting are from biologists and ecologists. And you have to understand that a lot of biologists and ecologists have spent their years in school doing bird counts and plant counts in riparian areas that have been overgrazed by cattle. And so their lens at the way they look at cattle is skewed in a way that has that already in there. And so for us to create a body of work to work with biologists and ecologists to showcase the power of proper grazing to enhance ecosystem function, that's going to change the culture in ecology and biology in your scientific communities because they've only seen what they know. And if they're out on BLM land and we've been turning our cows out on that permit the same time, the same way every year, because that's how that permit's structured. It's not really the rancher's fault. It's designed that way. So 
you have to turn your cows into that BLM allotment at a certain time of year, and they're going to go to the riparian areas and they're going to sit there. And so there aren't mechanisms in place to manage differently there. And that's what biologists and ecologists have seen. And that's where they've done their studies and their work. And so mm -hmm. understanding that there's a culture already designed in there of, you know, cattle are a problem. They shouldn't be here. No, they're not the problem. It's management that's the problem. And so we just have to tweak some things to showcase that we can tweak the carburetor in a way that creates an incredible amount of life with the same animals that destroy life. You know, And it's the same analogy I give all the time is if your drunk uncle took his lawnmower and turned it on and parked it in the yard and went to the bar for two hours and then came back, that piece of yard was going to be smoked. But it takes somebody moving that lawnmower around to keep your yard healthy. That same lawnmower could have helped your lawn stay healthy. But if you leave it sitting there while you're idling and it's at the bar, it's not the lawnmower's fault. It's whoever was supposed to be pushing that lawnmower around. And there's structures in place that make it really difficult for ranchers who especially work on public lands because there's the way the grazing is set up is it's designed kind of in a way that doesn't allow you a lot of freedom to do different things grazing wise. And so mm. that's changing over time. And so over time, I think we're just, we need to just change that culture and realize that those ecologists and biologists that have the ear of the decision maker and policymaker may not be the same ecologists and biologists that I have here helping us with our data set. And so they have a completely different set of data that they're giving that person to say, we need to remove grazing off this landscape when that other biologist can bring a body of work in and say, and if you get a few biologists in a room, I've never seen people argue more. It's incredible. I thought, <laughs> oh, these are scientists, these are really educated people. They all know what to do and they're all on the same page. And you get three biologists in the room and they're like, don't you dare remove cattle from that pond, or we have to remove cattle from this pond, and they'll just go round and round, and they'll make all sorts of arguments as to what's best. And then me as a land manager, I have to t sort through that and go, okay, what do we actually have to do to help enhance ecosystem function? And then mm -hmm. also have a place for the cows to get a drink. And so it's kind of an interesting place where we're in right now, because that's starting to shift the more data we get and the better science we get out to showcase that we can do amazing things with a herd of cows, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of what I see. Yeah. Yeah. It it's tough when you can sit down with multiple quote unquote experts and then you're just getting yeah fingers pointing in three different directions. <laughs> well, you've gone to enough horse training and symposiums and stuff. It's always a different thing for a different person, you know. Everybody's got a little bit of a twist on it, you know. And absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. But yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about all this clearly just from the conversation we've had. Um, you are you are very well spoken and you um, to me, at least you seem like a really good ambassador about this stuff. And one of the reasons we had you on was Ben knew who you were um, because you were you were the announcer at the Pro-Am uh, roping in yeah. Ogden, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your uh background H how did you start uh announcing ranch ropings <laughs> riata and buck yeah they're uh <laughs> they pretty much told me that i'm coming to announce that and i was like okay and it, yeah we were just i used to be kind of a smart ass on facebook early on like i used to just crack jokes and dump memes all the time and they just got a kick out of it and they mm. i think wanted me there for comedic uh relief and as i've matured over time and became a more professional human i uh i'm, <laughs> I'm coming in uh more as an ambassador so to speak than than just uh you know cracking jokes but um yeah essentially you know carlos and i went up to montana together i was raised with carlos macias from buckaroo gear we were all in the okay. same town and him and i jumped in together went to montana and that's where i learned about buck and you know we got we were working for pete malnicker tying halters and and I saw a buck. And so the way I learned how to start horses is um, when I was a kid in California, I worked for um, a boarding facility because we lived in town and I want to learn how to ride horses. So I would clean stalls to get a, a riding lesson. And Juna Light owned this boarding facility and she gave horseback riding lessons after I cleaned stalls. And she was dating a guy by the name of Ed Machado who he just passed away last week and was an incredible human and just this old timey cowboy that had a love of California silver and California leather work and all the old California lore of the vaquero. And I got hooked to it. But the way we started horses was really kind of old school. And so 
it was snub them to your horn, blindfold them. And then I would, you know, get on his back of his saddle horse and we'd screw a saddle down to a colt. And then he would, you know, hand me the lead rope and he'd, as he's handing me the lead rope, he'd take his hand and swap that rag down off his eyes or his wild rag mm-hmm. down off his eyes and unblind them. And then he would haze me around and buck around the pan. And it was kind of a train wreck a lot. And it was pretty scary for them colts and, you know, it, it would bang us all up. And it was kind of a rough way to start horses. And, um, you know, so we just, it was just kind of the way it was there. And even working for some pretty good cow horse trainers, we always would tie up a leg or do a lot of sacking out, a lot of driving and uh, with driving reins and different techniques that were, you know, they worked, they got horses broke. But um, I went up to Montana and I'm, I see Buck Brandman giving a clinic and I'm sitting on the fence and I'm like, what is this guy doing? You know, it just changed the way I looked at uh, what you could do with a horse. And I thought it was all, everybody was bringing him just a bunch of backyard kind of horses that were already broke the way he was getting around them because he, nothing was going wrong. Like everything was just like every horse was just gentle. And then he got to a couple of ones that were just dang sure pretty alley. And I was like, okay, now we're going to see what, and same thing. He just did the same stuff with them and they all just got gentle and broke and he saddled them and turned loose and take them around the round pen. And, rope behind foot and get them all, you know, all of a sudden we're just riding, everybody's riding around their horses. And then I've never mm-hmm. seen anything like that. And so I got really hooked to, I mean, I was walking like Buck and talking like Buck and we were, <laughs> I was just all about it, you know? And so I was going around and just really excited about, you know, trying to do, um, you know, that style of horsemanship. And then I got around Ray and saw some of his clinics, uh, later on. And then, um, after that, it kind of just progressed into, chasing that horsemanship and and getting into the that way of life and then as time went on i just kind of kept the relationship going with buck and riata and i knew riata when she was really little she would come to the um to the clinics and she was on a little white pony and um you know they would just be having a good old time and so i got to see her grow up and then she went to montana state and was running that horse deal and i forget where we ended up kind of hooking back up as friends again but uh through social media, I think. And, and she just invited me to come do that. And that's kind of was the way it kicked off. And I've been doing it ever since. I love it. It's so fun and they're amazing people. And what's neat about the Brannemans is, um, you know, when they see that you want to participate and, and really, you know, authentically want to bring this whole thing up, they just, the door is open, you know, and it's like, come on, they'll just take you and, participate with you and take you along and give you great opportunities like the roping and you know and then it gave me a really neat point of view from sitting in that box to really understand what was going on and watch the nuance and really develop a kind of a love of the nuance of big loop style ranch roping that you know I didn't realize there was you know near as much to it until I started announcing it really watching everyone's technique and the way they use the point system and the way they kind of utilize their horsemanship and it's just really kind of over time evolved into where I really appreciate it. And then as I learn more about, you know, like the big loop roping and Winnemucca and, and there's just different subcultures to this cowboy culture that, you know, in Nevada and the big loop and the great basin, it's just such a neat culture because they try to honor that big loop style of roping. And there's a million ways to rope, but that's the style they want to hold on to, which is the rawhide riatas with the big, you know, 20 foot loop, 19, 16 foot loops and then learn how to manage that roe deer, which is the gathering of cattle. I don't know if a lot of your listeners probably know, but a roe deer is essentially the Spanish word for a gathering. And it's where you hold cattle up in a group and then ropers stand outside of that group and take real low stress shots with a lot of distance. And then they can rope that animal off the outside and they can take it out of the herd and allow you to just keep that herd together as a sacred place for those animals. So there's no a lot of banging and clanging and crashing into that roe deer it's really quiet and honored in a way that allows those cows to settle and be with their calves and then if you got to rope something you take it out away from the roe deer and you heal it and lay it down and do whatever doctrine you need to do to it and so having that tradition that evolved you know because everything kind of moved up from california and went up to the great basin as things got more difficult here to ranch and they took all their vaqueros and a lot of their culture up to uh, the Great Basin. And that's where the word buckaroo came from, is it's that bastardization of buckaroo. And buckaroo settled really well into the Great Basin. And it was so neat when I moved from California to Eastern Oregon to see so many people still cherished and valued that old way of managing their remudas, their cabbies, their their stockmanship out of the roe deer, 
all of that stuff was a really neat um, kind of system that was put into place that that's still in a lot of really good outfits you go to. And it's like clockwork. Everybody knows their position. Everybody knows what to do. Horses come in, they rope them off the ropes in the morning. And, you know, they have an organized way of moving through their their country and gathering their country on their circles. And it's just a really beautiful thing that I fell in love with. And I can't quit it, chasing it. And the people that do it are really quiet and they're out in the middle of these huge landscapes and they kind of need a mouthpiece and I've made myself the mouthpiece but I don't get it right all the time so I rely on people who live that life all the time to kind of help me get it right because I want to be able to tell that story and honor them because it's been amazing what they've opened up and shown me and taken me along to kind of participate in and and I've, it's just grown a deep love of big, wild places for me and in a, in a way that, you know, puts horses right up front, you know. And so horses are always, it's always about what you can do on that horse and how neat you can make that horse. And any kind of horse that they give you, they cut you, you can get on and ride it. And there's just, you know, they're going to get figure out a way to get along with any horse you give them. And it's really neat to watch really handy people kind of move through the world that way. And And so that's kind of where it's evolved from announcing these ropings to, you know, trying to tell that story in a way that shows the rest of the world that this even exists. Cause I don't think a lot of people even understand this is happening out here and, and it's really beautiful and it's really worth honoring and saving and chasing. And I think I'll probably spend the rest of my days kind of trying to do it right, you know, or do right by it. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it, like I said, you're very well spoken, but just hear you talk about it, your passion for it's very clear. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. So with these big loop ropings, uh, when you say that there is there is so much to it, I'd be curious to get your thoughts because you watched a lot of them. What do you feel like separates maybe those really elite guys? when you go and, and see them rope cards on the table, I really don't know a whole lot. Like I, I understand the concept of these ranch ropings um, and I've been around a couple of them, but I wouldn't say I have like a deep understanding of it or even a deep appreciation of it. And I'd like yeah. to build that, but the people that are really good, um, like for example, I just, I think they had a YouTube video out where I watched a lot of the highlights um, from the big loop roping in, was it Winnemucca? Or, yeah. Winnemucca. Yeah. Yeah, and that was really cool to watch because I know they were doing little different stuff, and like sometimes they'd have to like, you know, they they rope cows and things that were at least different from what I had seen in the past a little bit. Yeah. Um, but very obvious from the get go, a lot of really handy people. Yeah. Um, what do you feel like separates those people from uh, uh, if you're doing it, you're handy to some degree, but the really elite guys what do you feel like they have going on or they have in common with their peers that separates them? I think the really elite ropers have just roped a lot of cattle and they've done it in a way that um, they can read cattle and the people who really like cattle. And so what I find now is the (laughs) most um, elite ropers and the, the best stockmen and the best horsemen, they're all bottled up into one thing and what that thing is is incredible adrenaline control so they can walk into a herd of cattle and they can disappear or turn invisible and with their energy so you'll watch them walk into a herd and just their shoulders are relaxed everything about them is quiet their horse is absolutely quiet with them and so until they need that horse to wake up, that horse is invisible, just as invisible as that rider. And they walk into a roe deer and they position themselves to bring out that animal that they want to rope. And the way that they bring that animal out dictates the way they're going to rope. So if that animal moves off easy and just continues to walk out, like it doesn't even realize anybody's chasing it. It just kind of walks out because everything else is kind of moving a little bit. That roper can rear back and take an incredible shot and nothing around it is shook up. And so that motion is just a steady, a steady flow of energy. So the energy just walks out, they take their shot, get that animal roped and then head out. And that animal doesn't even know it's roped until he's moving off on the saddle horn. And that's really fun to watch with really elite ropers is they have that full package of 
stockmanship, herd work, being able to slide in and be sneaky. And then they come out and it looks like they've just been doing it their whole lives. I mean, they're just sitting there talking to each other and just headed to the fire. And I mean, just everything's really relaxed about it because they just live that life, you know. And so any angle that calf runs, they have a shot in their arsenal to throw. And so they can be just doing an overhand swing. They're deep in the herd. That animal changes position. You just see them just cock one loop over and they change the tip of that rope and they take a completely different shot. And it's really fun as an announcer because I get to see that thought process as they're walking through a herd. They're going to do an overhand swing. Boom, it's going to go over the left shoulder. And then one more breath, he switched it to a hula hand or he switched it to a completely different loop. And being able to kind of see that set itself up has been really fun to watch elite ropers do because not only are they setting up that shot really smooth and quietly, also their roe deer help, the people who are on the outside, they're helping them set up that shot. So they're moving in positions that allow that herd to rotate and float back to the corner or move in a way that's going to allow him to take a really good shot by stopping the animal that he doesn't want. And they do it in a way that's so quiet that it's just like watching a well-oiled machine. And when you see everything happen like that, it it's a really beautiful thing to watch once you understand it, you know, but if you see people out there doing big moves and a lot of banging and clanging and then those cattle are squirting out and your road ears moving around a lot, that's actually frowned upon in this culture. And so you want to move in quietly and really smooth and keep those cows need to be the same cows they were before you saw them. So you're walking in there to train those cattle to be better when you leave. And so if you go in there and just rattle them up and blow the roe deer apart and they're scattering and the calves are scared and you've just changed that whole dynamic of that herd for the next roper that's going in. Cause now he has to settle that herd. He has to get those cattle put back together and then set up a shot. And so it's just one thing that kind of gets across the line is if the really good ropers have an incredible ability to just handle that energy flow. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it, it's one of those things. I'm, I wouldn't consider myself very handy with a rope, but I've gotten to a point where I can, you know, I, I, at least here in our little lab or whatever you want to call it, I, I feel comfortable like going out necking a yearling and doing that here. And, but I am very aware that there is a lot of room to grow, especially when you watch guys like what you were just describing. <clears throat> and it's one of those things where initially it, it was obvious to me that, well, the stockmanship can help your roping, right? Because you see, I've, I've been around people and if you've ever, you know, taught people to rope, as soon as they get horseback, they're like, oh, these people haven't spent a lifetime around cattle. So maybe I'm seeing things that they're not seeing. Like it's, yeah. you know, I'm like, okay, well, X, Y, and Z is about to happen. And they only saw X. Yep. Right. Because they just haven't spent the time around livestock. Yeah. Um, and part of it's just a feel you develop over time. But what's cool is the more you do it, it's really obvious. It's like, yeah, the stockmanship helps your roping and you'll catch more and, you know, get to have fun or, you know, why ever, whatever reason you're doing it. Um, but also the roping will help your stockmanship. And you just described that where if you have all those shots in your arsenal, you don't have to, you know, get that steer lined out just so, or you don't like, you can fit the situation so much better. Yeah. Um, and that might seem obvious to people, but at least to me, when I first started, I didn't think about it that way it was like well yeah i want to learn all these shots and like it'll be cool to know these shots and look cool but it's like no if you're gonna do this a lot having them is it, that is how you fit the situation and fit the animals is being able to do those shots so it's not just a um not just a like building yourself up because you want to have a better skill set it, it it does become vital and i don't think on the outside looking in people realize that because they see the big fancy loops in there, yeah. you know, and the guys in the flat hats and the mustaches. And there, there is a lot of pageantry um, and vibrato to it, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's easy for some people to make the mistake of thinking, well, the big loops are just part of that, right? Yeah. It's part of the show. And it's like, no, they, they actually are, the best way to fit the situation because you don't have to 
get too involved with how they're going. Like you said, you just change one swing and it's on there. Yeah. And if you're handy at that, you're fitting the situation, fitting the animals. It's lower stress, more peaceful. Yeah. Like you said, this really kind of almost sacred thing is happening in front of you. Yeah, it's just it's it's um kind of a game of efficiencies, you know. It's it, is it efficient to shake those cattle up now? Is it more efficient to leave them settled? Yep, they're going to keep gaining weight. Is it efficient to have to chase that animal out because you only know one shot, so you have to get it into that position to take that shot? Or is it more efficient to just swing differently because that animal's at a different angle and catch it wherever it's sitting, you know? And so once you get that really good love of watching what's happening, it's it's like watching somebody paint a picture. It's just, it's like art, you know? And so, and watching those people, they never lays their focus. You never see them you just you never really know what animal they're after, you know, until they bump it out, you'll kind of get a feel for it. And like, Oh, okay. Now we see where he's at, but he's never given that, or she has never given you those two eyes, just laser focus on that animal. They're just looking around. All of a sudden they bump that critter out and take a shot, go to the fire, you know? And so it's because they understand that feel, you know, and, and it's just getting to be an incredible thing to watch, you know? And that's, what's fun about it is these kids are all growing up in it and watching them get every, you know, year you see just some young person girl or man come in there and just rope like a wolf and you're like oh this kid's gonna take everybody's money you know and he's just and they're so relaxed and they're having such a good time and that's what it takes to be a really good horseman and a really good roper and that's why your kids and your old people are really wonderful at both of those things because they're so relaxed they're not fighting their muscles they're not fighting their head they're just sending out loops and you're like that's really fun to watch you know yeah yeah yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, now I guess I can say it. It's not a big deal. But Ben, Ben and I, we'll, we're um, we're planning to have a booth for the podcast um, for the next program. So we'll nice. be out there. I'm I'm really excited to get out there and, and see that roping in person because it's it's um, a great event. It's a good place to kind of see it all happen, you know. And um, Ogden was a great place to have it. Um, you know, everybody comes out with their booths and vendors, and it's a great place to gather and just enjoy this and celebrate this way of life and what's fun about the pro-am and maybe a lot of people don't know is you're you're with a pro roper and then two of your team members are amateurs and so it's a perfect place to get introduced and participate horseback for your first time because you're in there with someone like dwight hill or gabe clark and they're talking to you the whole time so you walk in the rope and Gabe or, or Dwight Hill or anybody who's the, one of the pros is going to be saying, okay, go left two steps and take an overhand swing. And I'm going to bring this calf out to you. And they execute these really relaxed, awesome shots. And what a perfect way to, and that's what I love about Buck and the, the Brandemans as a whole is they could have just been Colt starting people. They could have just owned that space and done well for themselves but they push themselves to the next level all the time and so watching their horsemanship and they're making these awesome bridle horses and they're doing incredible work and they brought the spade bit back out in a way where when i was a kid you never saw anybody with a spade bit on and if it was it was an old timer who was really hush hush about it and he wouldn't tell you anything about it you had to work for him for 10 years and then he'd give you a couple tidbits. Well, now you see people just getting a hold and understanding its function and you see it all over the place now where it's really beautiful to see these old traditions come back into the light. And it took the Brannemans in, in a way that just brought people in because Buck kept going off and building these you know, competitions and he went to the Californios when it was going on and got in with these great basin guys and they, he just couldn't get enough of it and buck can rope like anybody you know and so he's one of the best ropers i've ever seen and so he just kept pushing that skill level up and getting people together and and celebrating this way of life and all of a sudden there's just a spotlight of um you know everybody pushed out of me mediocrity and they moved to a, a place where you see the progression of of the students of bucks going into really wolfy ropers. I'm seeing guys that could barely ride that went to work for and um, started following buck stuff, and then now they're winning the pro am. You know, and it's just an incredible thing to see, and it's it's got to feel so good to go through that with your horse and your progression because you always have something else to chase instead of just staying in your backyard and kind of just doing circles with your horse. 
it's like, no, we have a competition we get to go to to celebrate this. And someone's going to help me along the way. And everybody pulls you up into this rising sea, which has really been fun about it. So I'm excited to see you guys there next year. That'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. It, so that's really interesting to me because if I remember correctly, you said you grew up in California, right? Yeah. Grew up in and, California and around and the old space of guys. Yeah. Yeah. And so you didn't, you, I mean, it there wasn't was a common thing. Nope. You didn't see a lot of guys in the spade bit. Um, hmm. Maybe five or six guys I knew and they were all in their seventies, you know, and except for Ed Machado, who was kind of trying to hold on to the traditions, but um, it, it kind of got lost in, in translation over the years. And so now there's kind of been a renaissance and a rediscovery of understanding that equipment and people have spent enough time in it now trying to understand it that they have a really good understanding of the functionality of the hackamore and the spade bit and the two rain and that old California system that was born here um, out of necessity. And so it, it became a situation where, you know, these Spanish families kept it really close to the vest and their Vaquero crews stayed on. And it was kind of a, they used to put competitions called fiestas on. And so they would have these week long fiestas where they would gather all the, you know, uh, other ranchers together and they'd have competitions and these ranches had elite horsemen. And so that's where your horse show industry came from and your rain cow horse and stuff is it evolved out of this class of rancho stuff where you had these elite cowboys that they would put up against another ranch and they would have these competitions for, with um, all these other um, ranches around the way. And the, during fiestas, they would start to have these rodeos and that's kind of how it all kind of evolved. And what's really fun is kind of, it got lost over the, you know, the colonization and the green go fight, you know, everything in the Spanish, uh, California kind of got jumbled up and, and, you know, people were cutting spoons off spades and they were just doing all kinds of things where a lot of that old story got lost. And so now there's kind of been this renaissance of why was this built? What was it for? And is it relevant today? And I, I, I it's incredible to see how many people have a really good understanding of making horses now, really good bridle horses in the spade bit, which is really fun to see because it's mm -hmm. something you really can't, um, rush where today's horse industry, you're moving horses pretty fast through the program, you know? And so with the yeah. bridle horses, it's just something that can't be rushed. And if it is rushed, you can tell because there's a lot of kind of gaps in the training and I've rushed horses for sure. And I've, you know, just to see what I can do. And there's just really no way you can rush it, you know? And so I've tried to cheat every way I can and I can't figure out. So <laughs> it makes it really, uh, a pure thing because it's designed to kind of be that way where it, there's only certain things you can do with it. And your horse has to understand how to carry these things and he has to do his job and he has to understand the ranch work and understand how to move his feet and give a lot of confidence and develop self carriage and all the things that you need to develop over time to become a seasoned finished bridle horse. That's really fun to watch. So it's, it's neat to see. And I think the Brandemans have done an incredible job of just bringing this all to where it is today. You know, it's, I think that'll be the legacy, you know, it's just, they're leaving this incredible amount of horses and horsemanship on the ground here, which is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I didn't know a whole lot about the, obviously the history you were referring to as the, the old missions and things like that. I've, I've heard that, um, several times over and being on the east coast i'm not as intimate with it not like being there um but as far as fading from popularity and then coming back into popularity at least from my perspective <clears throat> like th there are people here now I i'd say it's there everywhere there are people that um know you know know what bridle horses are understand the spade bit um to varying levels of um like they, they know it to varying levels but my my perception of it was you know it was kind of ray hunt the dorances and then buck Brandman, at least in the eastern united states like those were the people that kind of like made this pilgrimage and brought this style yeah. over here um i did i wasn't aware that from what you're saying it sounds like there was a similar impact in california where this all started um you know not that it wasn't there but it came to the forefront again um but yeah and, and we're we're like everywhere else you know there's people with bridle horses and then there's people with um horses that have spade bits in their mouth right sure um but that that is um 
that that's really cool to hear. And I know um, Buck probably likes likes to hear you say that because you know he he's talked about in his clinics and I think on our podcast too. Maybe um, there was a time where he'd take like a finished bridle horse and then go to the Eastern United States and just ride it around in the snaffle because he was like, yeah. it's not it's not worth the time to even yeah. get into like what <laughs> what's that in your horse's mouth. But, and me personally, I'm really thankful he stopped doing that you know because it's um it is really cool and uh it is kind of this this sacred pure thing like you said you can't rush it you can't buy it with money you can like that that's the coolest part to me is like you can buy someone else's bridal horse but like is is that really still a bridal horse if you can't you know you you still even if you buy the nicest violin in the world if you don't know how to play it yeah you know is it well it's a chunk of wood with strings or is it really that nice violin yeah well that's what's funny is like i i get on tiktok and i and i watch like a a guy in mexico make a pair of shoes by hand with no tools and you know essentially the old cobbler way and i watch him build this shoe and i'm like oh my gosh and then he just sold that shoe to someone and i'm like i don't I don't know if that guy was going to appreciate that shoe because that shoe was pretty incredible to watch you make it. And it's kind of the same way with bridle horses is it's, it's, it, there's a return back to, you know, there's this mass produced say clothing line. And then now you're seeing people go back to handmade tailoring again. It's like, how, how was that done? And, you know, and there's so much to it, you know, and you have the best saddle makers and the best silversmiths that have ever been on the planet right now, you know, and it's incredible to watch, this art become um, appreciated. And if you watch anybody, and that's what's neat about social media, cameras up and they're letting you watch them build something. And once you see that, you go, take my money, dude. That's, mm -hmm. I'll never do that. That's, I don't know how you make any money doing that. Take my money. Like there's, like, if they charge you something, you're like, that seems expensive when you first see it. But then you watch them build it and you're going, here, I'll tell to give me that saddle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, it's such an art, you know, and it requires so much labor and a love of all the tiny things that it takes. And that's essentially horsemanship. And a lot of your saddle makers and your and your silversmiths and your braiders are buckaroos. And they're all, you know, they're all cowboys who a lot of them have, you know, started doing something extra for mo extra money and trying to mm -hmm. do something different. And I would like them to be able to make a living a horseback again in a way that we have opportunities that people can get back out there and move cows around and do stuff and and add more value to their communities and not and i love seeing their saddles too but th we need their wisdom out here on the on these grasslands too because those are your people those are your druids those are the ones that know what to do you know yeah well let yeah. me let me ask you this um th this was this was kind of my my thought on hearing everything you said tonight and and we'll get to a wrap up soon but um someone we've had on the podcast in the past this is a good friend of mine named Nathan Hahn and he runs uh what I would consider is a very successful uh ranch in Kentucky um and they've got a uh you know direct market beef program and he's done a very like to me in the eastern United States it's like a model ranch for what the intensive grazing thing can do and accomplish well, prior to setting all that up, he rode horses for the public, you know, um, learned from Buck, all these different things. And he said that all of that horsemanship background and and he's as reverent as anyone for the kind of the spirit of the bridal horse we've been talking about and things like that. He said being exposed to all of that, he felt it really helped him be open to the new ideas of this regenerative grazing because it, me personally, I tend to agree with them. I think there are a lot of parallels you can draw um, through, you know, maybe this like older style of managing animals, this older style of how they really impact the land versus, you know, you talk about the modern horse industry. It, it is what it is, but there's a lot of that, you know, in the modern, modern, um, beef industry where, you know, like you said, they just chuck the cows out. And then over time you, you become like South Africa, you become, um, overgrazed and understocked and 
you you lose these these fine things. Um, but he said just that style of horsemanship and being not that Buck Brandman taught him anything about grazing, but he said he got me in a frame of mind where yeah. when I got around the grazing stuff, I was ready to hear it and yeah. I was open to the new ideas. Um, and it hearing you talk about everything you've got going on in your past and everything, it that idea seems to really resonate with what you're saying. So I don't know if you feel that way, that that horsemanship um, kind of allowed you to be, you sound like a very open-minded, like I said, well-spoken guy who you, you want to have these new innovative ideas and, you know, you just spent however long you've been around this style of horsemanship, you've been open to these new ideas, right? Because you were like, I don't want to, blindfold colts for the rest of my life yeah you know and i don't want to pack the dirt around the waterers for the rest of my life i want to do things better and i always want to try to be better right yeah yeah no i think that's right i think the way that um yeah the way that buck looks at the world is it's just stop and ask why you know he's really good at that you know and so mm -hmm. well that doesn't make any sense you know and so there's kind of a interesting train of thought where you and then also fix it up and wait you know that's always good it's just mm -hmm. it, this thing that we're doing with this using cattle to enhance ecosystem function is been happening for a long time there just hasn't been a lot of data sets and so you know i'm not telling any rancher they're doing anything wrong all i'm saying is we're trying to build a data set to prove this out and we have to fix it up and wait meaning we just have to keep doing the work and let the data tell the story. And so I am, I, I don't know how long this will take and w when it happens, it'll happen. And I won't have to say anything because the data will say it. And if you think about that through horsemanship, it's like, if you do it right, it's, it's going to work. And so if you set it up right and you made it where it's something that that horse is going to want to go and, and find that easy path. I think that that's kind of where we're at here now is there's a, there's a reason to change there's no money to change. Like nobody's funding a lot of these changes that need to be made. So it's too much risk for most ranchers to take. So you don't want to change your production model because you know that you have somebody going to buy those calves. And if you start doing something differently, it could, you know, hurt you economically. And so if you have that working in your, in, in the past and keep doing it, but over time, the structures are going to have to be changed to incentivize for change. So we have to fix it up. We have to build the framework out so that you have somewhere as a rancher to go into. And so if you build out this animal that's, you know, adding value and you're, you're able to adapt those genetics to fit your landscape, and it's going to be maybe a 700 pound cow, which used to be the way in the United States, cows were small. And now we're cranking them out 14, 1500 pounds pretty easy. And so understanding that, that we had a smaller cow herd in terms of frame size. And if we had to go back to that to fit our country, how do we do that without being economically wiped out? And so, you know, there's no, we have to build the structures for people to appreciate it and, and funnel cattle into essentially. So I, I think ranchers are doing exactly what they need to do. They're inventive people and if the goalposts were different, they would chase those goalposts. And essentially, as long as the goalposts are, these animals need to be able to perform well in a feedlot or whatever that goalpost is and get compensated to be in a program or you need to have this, you know, whatever that framework is to incentivize for, you know, to be able to capitalize on. In order for us to change the cow herd in a way that's going to add more econo or ecological value, it's going to take a different kind of critter because we're not potentially going to be going into those feedlots. And so, but there's nothing out there for anybody to go into right now. There's no regenerative producer coming to my door wanting to buy my cattle. So I'm not going to set my whole life up hoping that's going to happen because it's not for a long time. And so you just keep doing what you're doing and then we'll just build out some data sets and frameworks and some projects. And then maybe over time that'll make a shift where things are a little different, but you got to exist in the framework that exists today or else you'll just fall apart. But if we can yeah. start to kind of change things up to add more value and, and prove out the cattle are an incredible asset for ecological health, I think that over time is going to change the game down the road, you know, so. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the core principles of everything we've talked about tonight is balance, right? Yeah. And so you need to be looking for new solutions, ways, like you said, ways to add value. Um, you need not be married to anything. But like you said, don't change everything overnight. That's yeah. just no one should do that in any business, really. Um, so, yeah, it's Jeff. It's been really cool to hear about all this stuff, and I I know I, we definitely want to get you back on because I oh sure I would love yeah. to hear how this would progress. You know, maybe um, maybe we'll get a hold of you in Ogden and we'll do one in person. That'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be a lot Good of fun. Man. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hit uh, stop recording, but don't hang up yet. Yeah. Howdy there, listener! If you enjoyed this episode of On the Move, here's a couple things you can do to help us out. First of all, you can head on over to Spotify, Apple, or Google, or wherever you listen to this podcast. And leave us a review and give us a five star rating. If you can't do five, do four. If you really can't do four, do three. Don't go lower than that, but give us a rating. Additionally, if you haven't already, follow us on the social channels. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and now apparently on TikTok. However, I don't have TikTok and I'm not sure how that works. I'm sure you guys do. Now, if you'd like to support us monetarily, which we would so very appreciate, head on over to www.onthemovepodcast.com. There you'll find our merch. We got some cool hats, got some mugs, some stickers, all the latest On The Move merch so you can be out there rocking it. And these hats are nice. They're uh, good quality. Joe and I wear them all the time. Also, if you are getting ready to build... A steel building, maybe a barn dominium, garage, new horse run-in shelter, or you need an innovative steel fencing system, head on over to our friends at www.metalmdi.com forward slash on the move. And they can help you find a great deal. Well, that's about it, folks. You can find all these links in our bio. Until next time. Stay on the move.